tonight on Politicat. Life after leaving Neverland, fallout from the latest allegations against Michael Jackson. And Facebook faceplants new numbers show the future isn't looking so bright for Facebook. We'll dive into the dark side of social media. Plus, you can't make this stuff up, or can you? A new development in artificial intelligence has people questioning reality. Those stories and more tonight on Politicat. It's your politics right, right now. now. Good evening and welcome to Politicat. I'm Joey Safchik. And I'm Justin Sweetwood. Let's get right into tonight's top stories. New tonight, Paul Manafort will serve 47 months in federal prison on tax and bank fraud charges. That's a little less than four years. Federal prosecutors asked Manafort to serve upwards of 24 years. Before handing down the sentencing, the judge in the case praised Manafort for living a, quote, otherwise blameless life. Also today, Michael Cohen filed suit against the Trump Organization, alleging the company is in breach of contract for not paying nearly $2 million in legal fees Cohen incurred after agreeing to cooperate with federal prosecutors in the special counsel investigation. The former Trump lawyer made headlines last week for his explosive testimony in front of the House Oversight Committee. Shocking developments yesterday in a case against former Illinois Representative Aaron Schock, who was indicted in 2016 after financing luxuries like a private jet and lavish bonuses using government and campaign funds. Federal prosecutors in Chicago will drop all felony charges against Schock if he pays back almost $70,000 in taxes and returns to his congressional campaign. In exchange for the deal, Schock's campaign pled guilty to improperly reporting expenses, a misdemeanor. A documentary detailing alleged abuse by Michael Jackson shook pop culture critics and viewers on Monday. The HBO film follows two men, now adults, who say Jackson groomed them to be molested throughout their childhood and teenage years. These allegations come after decades of rumors of predatory behavior. Michael Jackson has faced sexual assault charges in court before and was not found guilty. To dive into this, I'd like to welcome in our panel, we have Mia Mamone of North by Northwestern and Ben Trachtenberg, our very own politics director here at NNN. Now, Mia, why are these stories only be take, being taken seriously now? I think a big part of it definitely has to do with what we've seen with the Me Too movement that's happened in the past few years. Obviously, that's been focused on, you know, specifically the stories of women, but I think a big part of, you know, the women's movement is saying that no one is immune and that children, vulnerable people in society, this can happen to them, it can happen to men, it can happen to anyone. So I think what we've seen with lots of people being more comfortable coming forward and telling their stories, that's really helped these people now be taken more seriously. I, I absolutely agree. I think that the Me Too movement has shifted the conversation. Um, survivors of sexual assault and sexual violence have uh, been, their voices are being heard, and um, it's very much in the popular uh, mindset right now to, to hear these stories and to reckon with what happened. So Michael Jackson died a decade ago in 2009, so he can't stand trial or face any consequences. So what will be the ideal outcome of this situation? Well, that, that's difficult to say. I think that in one sense, he has a huge fan base. Um, his music was incredibly important for much of the later half of the uh, 20th century. I think that the overall lesson I think that this society has to learn is that people who are famous celebrities um, can't quite be lionized to the extent that they are um, and, and celebrated absolutely as a lot of uh, the people who have been brought down by this Me Too movement have been in the past. Definitely. I think, yeah, no one is immune. None of your favorite celebrities, no one maybe you know in your own personal life is immune from you know, falling from grace in such a way. And I think ideally this will just start a conversation of, you know, believing people when they tell their stories, even when that's incredibly hard, when their stories kind of indict someone who has meant a lot in your life. It's very important to listen to what people are saying when they finally do have the courage to say what happened to them. So these new allegations against Michael Jackson come just weeks after Surviving R. Kelly, the documentary series that detailed alleged abuse and pedophilia by the Chicago R&B superstar. 
Kelly denied the accusations against him in an emotional interview on Monday. He was recently arrested on sex abuse charges and is back in police custody after failing to pay his child support. Like Jackson, Kelly had been the punchline of jokes about sexual assault for decades. His alleged mistreatment of women is very much an open secret in the industry. So why did these men get away with this behavior for so long? I think it's just because, especially in popular culture, this kind of attitude is very normalized and even valorized when it comes to masculinity and when it comes to, you know, who has power and who has dominance, who can get away with, you know, whatever they want, it seems, when they're in that like high of a position. So I think, you know, especially like with Me Too and we've seen other men who are incredibly famous and powerful, you know, kind of having to answer to what they've done. And so I think now we're kind of taking another look and saying this shouldn't have been part of the equation all this time. And are their reputations permanently damaged? Oh, absolutely. I definitely think so. Um, you know, obviously there's a lot more truth that needs to come out and I'm sure more details will be revealed as every day. But I don't see, um, I certainly don't see R. Kelly coming back from this, and I think that Michael Jackson's reputation will, will be tainted for a very long time. Now, Ben, you talk about a permanent, you know, tainted reputation, but why did it take a documentary for these allegations to be taken seriously by the public? It's been something talked about for a very long time. Well, I think that, you know, a lot of the information has been in the form of both sort of innuendo, and also uh, there have been some court cases that uh, Michael Jackson was involved with, and I know that he was found not guilty, and those that not guilty um, verdict can kind of put a, a, a cap on that discussion for a long time. This documentary, I, I believe, you know, decides to go into it a little bit further and uncover some facts that may not have been public information before. So I definitely think that um, the power of journalists to dig deeper into these cases than um, you know investigators at, at a specific time uh, is really being shown here and it's been shown with almost all of these uh, cases that we've seen during the Me Too movement it's been journalists really leading that charge and, and putting the stories out there. Definitely I think we have hindsight and you know we can kind of look back and kind of go over the facts that we've had but might have been more confusing or contested you know when Michael Jackson was alive and all these things were going on and I think specifically um, since the documentary interviews these two men who in the past defended Michael Jackson and said, you know, nothing that happened was bad, that they said that their relationships were fine. And in the documentary, they mention how they've gone back and kind of really had to be very introspective. And they've kind of, are, they've come to terms with the fact that they were groomed and they were abused. And so I think that gives a special credibility because they say like, yes, we said these things in the past, but it's taken a lot of cultural change to be able for them, especially as men, to realize that they are survivors of abuse. How do you think this will f uh, affect the future of the Me Too movement, or is it just another piece in a very large and troubling puzzle? I think y hopefully this opens up the floor for more men coming forward, or you know, more people who wouldn't be seen as your like typical victim, which is you know a terrible phrase, you know, a survivor of um, assault. And so I think hopefully you know these men they've survived, they've created lives, they have families and stuff. So I hope that they can kind of help inspire other people who might be more worried about coming forward who don't see themselves as, you know, maybe as easily believed as others, that'll give them kind of empowerment to come forward. I, I absolutely agree. I think that, um, you know, it's such an incredibly complicated sort of societal effect when, when people come out as victims of, of sexual violence. I think for, for men particularly, it's very hard to, uh, admit that you have been the, the victim and I think that there's so much if you look at the, the, the humor in this country uh, men are the butt of jokes about sexual violence constantly I mean you think about prison rape jokes it's it's normalized to it to an incredible extent so if this does anything I think it'll it'll show that that is not necessarily something that's to be uh, to be joked about and something to be taken much more seriously all right we'll have to leave it there we'll be right back with more Politicat after this break at Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way.
right through that. Ah, with our colors flying, we will cheer you all the go. Go you Northwestern, fight for major sweet victory, for the fame of our fair name, and go Northwestern, win that It's been quite a year for tech giants. Apple, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, and Amazon all capturing major headlines, sparking heated debate on Capitol Hill and on the trading floor. We have a look at two of the most prolific tech companies of the moment. Justin, what's happening with Amazon? 2017, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos became the richest man in the world. Last year's net worth crossed the $150 billion plateau, making him the richest man in modern history. But what does the future of Amazon have in store? How about 87 fewer pop-up stores? The company announced this week that it's closing all of its kiosk-like shops across the country. But this is not exactly something to be afraid about if you're holding on to some Amazon stock. Some think the pop-up shop venture, stationed in various malls and grocery stores, was just an experiment to collect data on shoppers across the country. Amazon knows that it generates most of its revenue online, but when it purchased Whole Foods for $13.7 billion in 2017, some thought it wanted to start its own food store enterprise, which is exactly what the company plans to do. Since 2017, grocery delivery service Amazon Fresh had partially been rolled out, but now leases have reportedly been signed to open grocery stores in major U.S. cities like Washington, D.C., L.A., Seattle, and Chicago. This caused Kroger and Walmart stock to take a dip, while Amazon shares rose over 1%. What the true intentions were behind the pop-up shops, we may never know. But if there's anything for sure, it's this. There is no limit for what Jeff Bezos might conquer next. Back to the desk. Thanks for that, Justin. Facebook, can't live with it, can't live without it. Since 2004, the social networking site has weaseled its way into our national consciousness, becoming a requisite tool for connecting in the digital age. Now, they've been rocked by scandal after scandal, and users are starting to lose trust in the company. A survey out yesterday shows Facebook lost 15 million users since 2017. Another poll shows the company's favorability is at an all-time low. Data privacy and misinformation, two ghosts that keep coming back to haunt Facebook over and over again. That's right, Joe. It's not a great time to be Mark Zuckerberg, and now we're going to welcome back in our panel. And Ben, let's start with you. How has Facebook gotten itself in this position, and is there anything they can do to regain public trust? Well, I, I think the story really starts when they became a public company. Um, you know, I, I heard it said once, and I, I couldn't tell you who said this, but um, when you use a free service, you are the commodity that's being traded. Um, and in Facebook's case, it's your information, your private information, every facet of your um, personhood is being used and sold to different companies. So that is the way that Facebook makes profit, hands down, um, and that's what's getting them into trouble now. And they are not a profitable company without that, as far as I'm concerned. So I don't quite see how they could get out of this situation, and that's how I think they got into it. Can it be recovered from, Mia? You know, I'm not sure. I think the advantage Facebook has is that billions of people are already kind of ingrained in it and they're kind of, you know, it's easier to just stay signed up than, you know, kind of completely pull yourself out, especially when people use it for networking and, you know, connection and our very globalized world. People are very far away from friends and family. So I honestly, I think they're trying, um, but I don't fully know how well in the end it'll actually work out for them. I th think overall, even people who are staying on Facebook for whatever reason are still very critical of the company. But is this a simple PR issue, or do you think people in general are losing their faith in big social media and tech companies like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram? I think it is indicative of a bigger issue. I know there's a lot of talk on Twitter, you know, with various scandals of who gets to continue being on Twitter after saying very vile things about other people, what counts as hate speech, stuff like that. Um, so I think kind of as we get more and more involved in social media and it becomes a bigger part of our lives, it's just something people are looking at is like, how does it fit in? Who can you trust? I think it's not just Facebook, it's a lot of companies. Yeah, I, I, I th I've done a lot of thinking about this and, and wondering, you know, how far can society go with social media and, and is there a wall that it can hit um, where the negatives start to seriously outweigh the positives? And I think that, you know, with some of the you know, online hate that we've been seeing, the, the influence that social media had on, on our politics in the last few years. We're starting to realize that these websites, 
Twitter, Facebook, and so on, have huge implications for the actual fabric of our society. Um, I think we really need to reckon with that, and I wouldn't be surprised if it starts to wane in popularity in the next few decades. Now, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg put out a blog post yesterday saying he wants to shift his platform away from public sharing into more private group-based messaging like Snapchat or WhatsApp. He seems convinced that this is the way of the future, but is this what Facebook should be doing, Ben? Well, it's a, that's a difficult question. I mean, it, do they believe that that's, that's what they should be doing in terms of making money? Well, I'm assuming Mark Zuckerberg has good information and, and he has a reason for saying that, so perhaps. Do I think that's the right way for us as a society to go and trust Facebook even further with you know our, our private messages? I, I don't know. I mean, there's been a lot of questions asked about when we send messages over Facebook Messenger, how private are they? Are they being used to sell us things? Um, I, I don't think there's a lot of trust, and I think that might be a, a serious problem, both for their profitability and for people's acceptance of that as the service of the future. I'm going to jump in here. What role do young people play? In 2004, we were four or five years old. We don't know a world without Facebook. So you said in the next couple of decades you, there might be a decline. What role do you think our generation has to play in that? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I remember being in like fifth or sixth grade making a Facebook and it was very popular and then definitely over you know, the time of being in high school it declined significantly and it was like, oh, only old people use Facebook. But I think like now we're in college and everyone, you have to do your pub pushes, you have to you know, mark that you're going to events and share profit shares and things like that. So I think, um, young people also are very tech savvy and we also know how to use other platforms so if the things that make Facebook Facebook really aren't working or those are available in other places that young people will figure out how to use those certainly I think that if you talk to to people who are just a little bit younger than us they often don't even have a Facebook and they see no need for, to have it um, they use Instagram they use snapchat at much higher rates they engage with YouTube in a way that I don't think our sort of cohort really understands that well. Um, and it kind of shows how quickly the tide can change in the tech world as to who's using it and how they're using it. So um, I think that if the next sort of generation sours on it, it could go south really quickly. All right, thanks so much, Ben. We'll be back with more Politicat after this break. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. We know the news can be a little overwhelming, so we decided to catch you up on a few stories you might have missed. A high school senior from Ohio testified before Congress this week. 18-year-old Ethan Lindeberger discussed the dangerous role of social media in the anti-vaccination movement. Lindeberger got vaccinated against his mother's wishes. Dr. Jonathan McCullers also spoke in front of the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, saying, quote, there is absolutely no evidence at this time that vaccines cause autism. New Hampshire state legislators sparked outrage on Tuesday by wearing pearl necklaces during a committee meeting. The lawmakers, all men and Republicans, wore the necklaces during a gun control hearing featuring testimony from gun control advocates. Members of Moms Demand Action logged their outrage online, and Moms Demand Action founder Shannon Watts said, quote, it really is shameful to behave that way when your constituents are being brave enough to share their stories. The Women's Defense League of New Hampshire, a pro-gun group, responding said the pearls represented support for the Second Amendment and for women. According to the BBC, a dead gardener in Germany, Bernard Grauman, may have caused the death of a doctor who was killed by a booby trap. Additionally, two other people were hurt by a log laced with explosives that was placed in their home. The log is suspected to have been put there by Grauman before he died in his home. Police say they had a, quote, problematic relationship with the man, and they suspect he poisoned himself after setting down the traps. 
And rappers including 21 Savage and Meek Mill, along with academics and others in the music industry, filed an amicus brief with the Supreme Court on Wednesday. They asked the court to hear the case of Jamal Knox, who in 2017 was convicted of making threats to police after naming two officers in a 2012 song. The briefing argues the case represents an important consideration of free speech in song lyrics and has been referred to as a, quote, primer on rap music and hip-hop. Now we're going to welcome back in our panel for PolitiChat, where we talk about politics stories taking social media by storm. Now take a look at some of these faces. Now I'm not saying people, well, because they're not actually people. That's right, the faces on your screen legitimately do not exist. They're products of what's called generative adversarial networks. Now the technology behind it includes 512 dimensional vectors, which is a bit beyond my pay grade, but some hope these GANs can be applied to VR, gaming, and perhaps developing complete virtual worlds. Now, ben, what are some of the dangers of technology like this? Well, uh, it's quite an incredible piece of technology. Um, it's hard to say what exactly the dangers would be, um, but I, I, I think that as technology such as facial recognition software increases, um, I know it's being uh, rolled out in certain cities and in, in, um, public uh, security cameras and in unlocking phones and, and all sorts of things. I'm not exactly sure how this will be used, but the fact that you can generate a person who does not exist and it looks very much like a real person, um, pretty concerning. I don't see exactly what the good of it is, but we'll see. Mia, is this something to be excited about or very skeptical? I would be skeptical, I think, especially in the time where obviously we know there's a lot at stake on the internet. We've seen our elections influence. People have been tricked, you know, scammed. Um, there's fraud. I think having now these faces that aren't real people but seem like real people just adds even more confusion and kind of another thing people have to look out for. So I think it could be cool in some ways, but yeah, definitely just stay skeptical. Okay, quickly to end our show on a fun note, we're introducing a new game we'd like to call Head Lies. We'll read you three headlines. Two of them are fake, one of them is real. You figure out which one you think is serious. Ready? All right. Okay, the first group. Melania Trump was horrified Sunday night after she discovered President Trump cuddling the flag from CPAC in the Lincoln bedroom. Option two, President Trump called Democratic donor Tom Steyer a weirdo in a tweet on Wednesday, adding a relatively weak entry to his anthology of insults. And third, Elon Musk added to his Mars mission on Tuesday, saying that he would send potatoes on the man mission to, quote, see how real the Martian really was. Any takers? Well, I think that definitely sounds like something Elon Musk would say, and it also sounds like something Trump would tweet. And I know that Trump did cuddle the flag, but it wasn't in the White House. So I'm going to say the first one is the fake tweet. Is the fake? There's one story. real one, two fake oh, ones. Oh, one real mm -hmm. one. Um, then I'm going to say the last one's the real one. The other two are fake. Elon Musk and his potatoes. Yes. Mia. I similarly am torn between the Trump tweet and the Elon Musk. Um, Thing. I would have to go, I think, also with Elon Musk just because he's such a weird man. That would not surprise me at all. So I want to tell you, when I first read them, I also answered Elon Musk and his potatoes. I kind of wanted it to be true, but alas, it is the Trump tweet. Yeah. All right, we've got some more Elon Musk for the second round. <laughs> Our three options, Elon Musk tweeted photos of his face, photoshopped onto Dwayne The Rock Johnson. A new study shows eating hamburgers with mustard can lead to a 50% lower chance of developing heart disease, and a member of the French cabinet released plans to petition to renovate the Eiffel Tower to make it 10 stories higher than it currently is. What do you think, Ben? Oh, this one's hard. Um, I think it's the hamburgers. I have a it's true. The hamburgers one is true. true. I think it's true. Yeah? I think that's a good guess. I don't know. I kind of just want to say the Eiffel Tower one just because... That seems, maybe they're trying to like beat another record or something. I don't know what the reasoning behind that would be, but that's kind of fun. Actually, both wrong here. I gave <laughs> it away. I told you it was another Elon Musk one. It was uh, Elon Musk. So major Musk props to our writers yeah. who wrote those very creative and believable answers. Definitely. Yeah. We'll have to leave it right there. Thanks so much for joining us tonight on Politicat. We'll be right back with the final word. At Northwestern, we're wildcats in every way. Go on, Hudson Ray.
will cheer you all the go. Go you Northwestern fight. For they drop sweet victories for the fame of our fair name and go Northwestern win that game. Go Cats! At Northwestern University, we are pioneering innovation and achieving excellence across every imaginable discipline. University, the possibilities are endless. Well, this is our last Politicat for this quarter. We'll be on hiatus for the next few weeks, and our first show of spring quarter will be April 18th. So we wanted to let you know what news we'll be watching over the next month. Right now, the United Kingdom is slated to leave the EU on March 29th. That could change pending a few important votes in the British government. Legislators there have to decide whether to accept Theresa May's latest Brexit deal, leave the EU without a deal altogether, or move to delay Brexit until May has a chance to negotiate a new deal. The most pressing concern, what would happen to the border between Northern Ireland, which is set to leave the EU, and the Republic of Ireland, which would stay. Brussels has not been keen on compromising with the United Kingdom. Many experts are anticipating big headaches to come. As we reported last week, Chicago is still waiting to find out who the Windy City's next mayor will be. Lori Lightfoot and Tony Preckwinkle both made it to the runoff, which will be held on Tuesday, April 2nd. No matter who wins, Chicago will have its first black woman mayor. If Lightfoot comes out on top, Chicago will also have its first out lesbian mayor. Ten aldermanic seats and the city's treasurer also went to runoffs. Last week's election had a record low voter turnout, so we'll see if a less crowded race and hopefully nicer spring weather will bring more voters to the polls. We've still got 2020 vision. Who might announce their candidacy between now and our next show? Many Democrats anticipate an answer from former Vice President Joe Biden. His strategist told the New York Times this morning there's a quote 95% chance he will run. Beto O'Rourke is another potential candidate to watch. Not long ago on social media, he said he and his wife made a decision and are waiting to make an official announcement. Earlier this week, O'Rourke spoke with a potential campaign manager. It's also possible that a Republican will challenge President Trump. Israel will have snap elections April 9th. Benjamin Netanyahu has been Prime Minister of Israel on and off since the 1990s. Though he had a contentious relationship with President Obama, Netanyahu and Trump have been quite amicable, and Trump did move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Netanyahu is running for re-election, but Israel's Attorney General said he intends to indict Netanyahu on three different corruption cases. Official charges could take over a year to come down. We'll find out in just a few weeks whether he will maintain control of Israel's parliament. And, of course, if there's one thing we've learned from the Trump administration, it is to expect the unexpected. The news is as unpredictable as ever. Anything can happen in just over a month. And we're as anxious as you are to keep up with the whirlwind of political press we're bound to see. That's all the time we have for tonight. For all of us here at Politicat, I'm Justin Sweetwood. And I'm Joey Safchik. Thanks for a wonderful quarter, and have a great night.